So I think we're ready to start our session here. About a year ago or so, I, I, uh, I'm kind of boring in the sense that I listened to Audio Digest CDs on my way to work every day and pulled out one of the emergency medicine ones, and it was uh, this speaker by the name of Dr. Joe Lex, and he was talking about wound management and kept going on to different topics in that area that were so relevant to what I was doing in Instacare and in the office and so forth. Very good presentation. So I, I called Heather up, I sent her the CD, and I said, we got to get this guy to Ogden, to Ogden Surgical. He's spectacular. So uh, about a year ago, we contacted him. He was very willing to come up uh, and speak in Ogden. And then I'll uh, also offered to talk on his second topic, the uh, gunshot wound talk, uh, the gunshots to the different uh, presidents and so forth. Fascinating background. Dr. Lex is uh, originally from Illinois and then uh, spent some time in Vietnam. And after that was uh, in Dallas, Texas, and uh, was mentored by somebody from Parkland uh, in, at, in Dallas uh, and encouraged to go into the emergency medicine. And really, he has followed the, that specialty for the last 30 years. He's one of the, the grandfathers in that specialty, uh, graduated early on in, in a, a residency program, and really has been committed to education for this last 30 years. When you look at his CV, he's, he's been involved in board review courses. He's been involved in oral uh, review courses of uh, emergency medicine docs. He's received numerous awards uh, in emergency medicine. One of them he may be most proud of is you may know a lot of our national academies have an Educator of the Year Award. So the American Academy of Emergency Medicine has its Educator of the Year Award. They renamed it the Joe Lex Award in Education uh, several years ago. Uh, over the last four or five years, it looks like he's been involved more internationally uh, with uh, speaking and has been chair of the Scientific Committee of International Meetings, including places like Argentina, India, Poland, Italy, Spain, Vietnam, Turkey. He's got a, a scheduled meeting on the island of Kos, where Hippocrates taught for September of 2011. So an international speaker, well recognized in his specialty. We're lucky to have him in Ogden. Please welcome uh, Dr. Lex to the podium. Thank you. I always get a little taken aback when somebody reads my resume like that. Uh, it's actually been 44 years. I started in emergency medicine out of Fort Sam Houston, where I did basic medical training in January of 67. So it's, I've been doing emergency medicine for 44 years now, and as a medic, and then as a tech, and then as an ER nurse, and then I went to med school when I was 35, and did the residency in emergency medicine. And it's really scary because I'm 64 years old, and I'm still not sure where the career is going. I don't think I've reached cruising altitude yet. I'm not kidding. I am not kidding. I really don't know what's going to happen next. It's just so much fun being in emergency medicine. Two talks today, a left brain talk and a right brain talk. We're going to start by reviewing the literature on minor wound care, both in the emergency department, in minor care clinics, in offices, wherever you might take care of the simple puncture wound, the simple laceration. And then the second talk is going to be more of a right brain talk, where you don't really have to learn anything. But I want to tell you the medical history of the gunshot wounds in our four American presidents who have been assassinated. I have no commercial interest to declare. I have to figure out which button to push. There we go. Um, wounds account for more than 10 million annual emergency department visits. And they also account for more than a quarter of the closed malpractice cases against emergency physicians. Payout is not that much. The payout is still for missed MI. But most of a significant majority of lawsuits against ER docs is because people don't like the way that their wound was handled. We have two major treatment goals when we're dealing with wounds. We want to avoid infection and we want to achieve an acceptable scar. How many wounds get infected? Very interesting. If you look at the literature on this, it's very constant over the last 50 years. We know that it takes 10 to the fifth organisms per gram of tissue for infection to set up. 
but the majority of wounds only have 10 to the third organisms per gram of tissue. Constant infection rates through the years. What it comes down to is 5%. And this doesn't, it doesn't matter how you prep the wound. It doesn't matter how much you debride the wound. It doesn't matter whether you give so-called prophylactic antibiotics. There is this constant background noise of 5% for wounds. Interestingly, this applies to things that we consider high-risk wounds, like dog bites and puncture wounds of the foot. It's still 5%. So keep that in mind. And if you tell your patient that right off the bat, then you have, you have done a preemptive strike. If you tell the patient, no matter what I do to make sure this wound is going to heal without infection, there is a 1 in 20 chance this will get infected. So if it does get infected, the patient won't be surprised. There's this rumor about a golden period. You've heard people say, oh, you can't close it if the wound's more than six hours old. This is totally false. That's a made-up number. I'm not even sure where it came from. There are studies going back at least 30 years that show there's no relationship between the timing of the suturing and subsequent infection. Nylon in 1980 said up to 18 hours was still safe. It didn't increase the infection rate. My favorite study was this one. This was in a clinic in Haiti where sometimes people had to walk 24 hours for medical care. And in this clinic, there were 204 patients with simple lacerations. The mean time to repair was 24 hours, but look at the standard deviation, 18 plus or minus 18 hours. So there's this huge variation, and they did primary closure on all of these. And if the wound was less than 19 hours old, they got satisfactory healing, no infection, acceptable scar in 92%. If it was greater than 19 hours, look at this, 77% satisfactory healing. So this six-hour rule, just ignore that. You still prep the wound the same way that you would. Are we losing the sound? Oh, boy. Okay. Okay. All right, I'm going to stand here until they fix it then. Um, so regardless of time, just keep that in mind. 95, and, and the exception was the head and the face. I mean, let's face it, to get an infected face wound, you, have to, you essentially have to take a teaspoon of steaming manure and sew it into the wound. <laughs> then you might get a face infection. But no matter what the timing Head and face wounds healed effectively more than 95% of the time. So forget the golden hour. Now, how about tetanus? Do people still get tetanus? Worldwide, absolutely. It's a huge public health problem worldwide. More than a quarter of a million cases per year with a 50% mortality. In the United States, this is down to less than 100 per year. And 10% of these are in patients who have minor wounds or don't even remember a wound or have a chronic skin lesion. Two-thirds of the patients with tetanus are over 50. Now, this is older data, but, and I don't know if there's new demographics on that, but it makes perfect sense. Women get tetanus more than men in that age group, the older age group. Why, guys? Why do we get less tetanus than older women? Because we all got drafted, and we all got our immunizations. And women didn't get drafted. They didn't get that primary series of immunizations, necessarily. Um, there have been a lot of studies that talk about protective antibodies. I caution you on the protective antibodies that there are numerous studies which have shown even if people do not have protective antibodies measurable, a significant number of these, a majority of these, will actually develop appropriate antibodies when exposed because of an anamnestic response. So despite not having measurable antibodies, a considerable number of people are already covered. ER patients, a study done by Tom Steyer back in 89, 10% didn't have protective antibodies. Kumar Alagapan did a similar study on older patients and only 50% had appropriate titers. But um, I talked to Kumar about this. He's a good friend and he said that uh, it's just a number. 
people still will um, have pretty good protection when they are exposed. So I'm just showing you some numbers on this to show you that, that this is what people study. Be aware, this is a, um, this is a disease-oriented study. This is not a patient-oriented study. This is looking at a surrogate marker and trying to extrapolate that into something that actually makes a difference for patients. Over-treatment, under-treatment, we know that. We miss some people who need it. We over-treat some people who don't need it. No surprise. How well does the booster work? The booster works incredibly well. Incredibly well. They actually got 418 patients where they were able to measure a titer, and in one out of eight, there was no measurable titer. And yet, after getting the toxoid, everyone had protected antibody levels. So there is this anamnestic response that I mentioned before. 24 patients, last immunization 17 to 20 years prior, four years after the booster shot, all had protective antibody levels. The reason this is important, I'm still no? Okay. The reason this is important is because the incubation period for tetanus is 14 to 21 days. So if you can get a booster shot that gets your antibody level up in five days, you're covered. Why do we use DT instead of the toxoid? Well, in the pre-DT days, there were 100,000 annual cases of diphtheria with a mortality rate of about 10%. Now, by 1977, this was down to fewer than 100 cases per year, but then it started to creep up, especially with skin diphtheria. And in 1966, the recommendation was made that we use the lowercase d, uppercase t. Now, do you know the difference between the adult dose of diphtheria tetanus and the child dose? Child dose is uppercase d, uppercase t, and adult dose is lowercase d, uppercase t. Lowercase, lower dose. It's five micro microflocculation units versus seven. So theoretically, by giving an adult the pediatric dose, you could make the adult sick, and by giving the child the adult dose, they wouldn't get enough. Yes. Okay. One minute. You want me to be quiet for one minute. <laughs> okay. Here's, this is where you find I have a face made for radio. If you've got to stare at me and I'm not saying anything for the next minute. <laughs> have people started switching over? I don't have any slides on this, but have people started switching over to the new Tdap? Yeah, the Adacel, yeah. Yeah, you understand that what the CDC has recommended on this for healthcare workers is that even if you've had a booster in the last 10 years, you should get the new TDP within two years, two years of your last booster. And this is not for our protection. This is for the protection of our patients. That's why it's a federal thing. That's why it's being recommended. Because you know, they really don't care whether we get pertussis. I've had, I think I've had pertussis twice. I think I have. Um, but you know something? I don't know how many patients I might have infected with pertussis. And that's why we get the new one, is so we can protect our patients against it. That's not really part of the talk. I just thought I'd mention that since we're talking about tetanus booster. All right. I know you're recording. I, I project pretty well. I, I assume people can hear me fairly well, but um, maybe not. No, okay. All right. <laughs> that wasn't necessary. There, there are certain things you don't do around a Vietnam vet. That's one of them. <laughs> oh, jeez. You think we got it? Okay. Now, um, am I back on? Am I back on this now? Okay. Good. Um, 
Everybody says it hurts my arm, right? Eh, it, I don't know. I've never had a problem with it. But here was a 740 chart review. There's always a problem with chart review. Where a third of the people had local edema and tenderness. 15% actually had fever. One out of six people got fever. And a third, they somehow figured out, had some sort of anaphylactoid reaction. I find that hard to believe. That doesn't really, doesn't really pass the sniff test. Um, this was a huge group, 87,000 doses by jet injector. And they, they got about a third of the postcards back that they sent out. 43% of people claimed they had a sore arm. About a third said they had local swelling. Some had local itching, and about 1 in 120 claimed that they had an abscess or infection. Now, that was jet injector. That wasn't even a needle. What about the person who says, I'm allergic to tetanus? I think this has kind of gone away from the old days of the toxoid that was made from horse serum, and people were getting serum sickness. I found one case report of a patient having what appeared to be an anaphylactic reaction to a tetanus booster. Um, got 0.5 cc's of toxoid, immediately developed wheezing, strider, passed out, blood pressure 70 over 40, had laryngeal edema when they tried to intubate, and they, just, they were able to get him out of it with epinephrine. I mean, that sounds like a true anaphylactic reaction. But that's the one case report I could find on this. So most people who say they're allergic to tetanus have probably just had a sore arm or a little bit of redness of the anaphylactoid reaction in the past. Foreign bodies. Foreign bodies is the main reason that we get sued. It really is. If you look at the, the number of lawsuits brought for minor wound care, it's almost always because of a retained foreign body or a missed tendon laceration. Those are the two big things. There is this rumor going around that it has to be a certain type of glass. It has to be leaded glass to show up on uh, medical imaging. 1977, six varieties of glass buried in roast beef. 1982, 66 types of glass. I didn't even know there were 66 types of glass that were buried in chicken legs. And some of the fragments as small as a half millimeter and then 15 types of glass buried two centimeters deep in pork. It actually sounds like it'd make a pretty good barbecue. You got your chicken, you got your pork, you got your beef, uh, without the glass, of course. And what did the study show? It showed that all glass was shown on x-ray, regardless of depth, regardless of composition, and regardless of size, even to one half millimeter, if you knew what you were looking for, if you knew that there was glass there. Wood, forget it. Wood does not show up on x-ray. Splinters, sea urchin spines, sand in veal. Now, I find this interesting because this is before the heyday of ultrasound. This is 1988 when the ultrasound was still pretty crude, and yet they were able to find all of these things in wounds with ultrasound. Current studies show about the same thing. You can pick up virtually any foreign body with ultrasound. Now, CT and MRI found wooden foreign bodies, but I think that's a little bit of overkill. I'm not sure I want to do an MRI to find a foreign body. CT might be appropriate in some cases. Um, here's another study, two millimeter fragments between strips of steak and then plain x-ray, xerography, CT, and ultrasound. Glass was visible in all. Wood was visible only by ultrasound. And plastic was visible only by ultrasound. Um, what do I do to get rid of the... Should I turn one or the other off? I'm sorry, you've only got which one? The wireless on right now. Because I'm, I'm getting an echo up here. I'm not sure what you guys are hearing. Okay. Now, does it help to ask the patient? I mean, we always ask the patient, do you think there's something in there? And um, we try to believe our patients. And in this study... 438 patients said, yes, it feels like there's something in there. Uh, they were right 15 out of 41 times. But what does that mean? It means they were wrong 26 out of 41 times. Even with in careful investigation, no finding of foreign body. So you've got to explain to patients why it feels like there's a foreign body, the irritation of those superficial nerves, the skin nerves. 
I thought this was interesting. This study changed my practice. I remember when this study came out, and I kind of swallowed hard and said, okay, I'm going to have to do this. Because I'm a minimizer. I'm a test minimizer. I really am. Um, 226 patients with lacerations due to glass. Ten of them had obvious glass. They pulled the glass out. 160, you could see the bottom of the wound. You could see the bottom of the wound, and you couldn't see any glass in it, and they x-rayed it, and there was glass in 7%. If you could not see the bottom of the wound, there was glass in more than a fifth of them. So be generous with x-rays for foreign bodies, for glass. And as I say, this one changed my practice. Now anybody who has a broken glass injury automatically gets an x-ray, whether I can see the bottom of the wound or not. <clears throat> what happens if we miss it? A study of 200 patients with retained foreign body. Now, the caveat on this is not all of these people saw a doctor with the initial injury. This is just people who presented late with foreign body. Only 75 out of the 200 had actually been seen by a doctor, and there wasn't a breakdown to tell you which of the people seen by a doctor had a worse complication. All this was is a study of 200 retained foreign bodies. But the average time to removal was seven months. 16 patients had infection, 8%, which is a little higher than that 5% I talked about before. And four had a neuropraxis. They had some sort of peripheral nerve problem because of pressure on the nerve from the foreign body or from the granuloma that formed around it. Um, partial flexor tendon lacerations, I thought this was interesting. It's not going to change my practice. I'm still going to make sure these things get repaired. But here are 34 patients with partial flexor tendon lacerations. Some of them were as much as 95% disrupted. They were remobilized after a week of immobilization, and nobody ruptured a tendon. This is not part of the talk. This is, you could go to any pediatric emergency textbook, give you plenty of good information on this. Uh, but I used to include this back in the days of... Uh, papoose boards and the horrible things we used to do to kids to sew them up. Um, the, the young people in the room may not know this, but I, I think there are some, I see some, you know, gray heads and, or gray hairs and no hairs here who are going to remember the days, how did we used to sew up a kid's tongue laceration? Put them in a papoose board, wait until the kid stuck the tongue out, take a 1-0 nylon, grab the tip of it with a 1-0 nylon suture, hold the tongue out. Has anybody else done that? Yeah, okay. Yeah, we used to do that before we did procedural sedation. I think that was outlawed by the Geneva Convention in the early 1980s. Um, lots of local anesthetics out there. Cocaine is still the standard against which all others have to be graded. Um, it's gotten a bad rep because of its illegal use, and I certainly heard the talk earlier today from the DEA person. But cocaine is still a pretty doggone good anesthetic. It's just that it's expensive and it's hard to get. Um, we prim primarily use the uh, lidocaine these days, which is an amide. And um, I love it when somebody gives you a totally useless memory tool. Here's a totally useless memory tool for you. All amides have two eyes. How useful is that if you can't spell? <laughs> or if you don't know how these things are spelled? If you're looking at it, it, it's a curiosity. You can say, oh, look, there's two eyes. That means it's an amide. So what? So what? It's just one of those little, little bits of medical trivia. If people say they're allergic to canes, uh, I thought this was interesting because you could almost take this data and put it for penicillin also. People who say they're allergic to penicillin, about 4% actually are. It's the same with this. 208 patients who said they were allergic to local anesthetics. They got epidermal testing, and four had an immediate response, four had a delayed response, and the other 200 got absolutely no response. This is the same data, like I say, that you see in penicillin when people are challenged with it after they, they've told you they're allergic to penicillin. Um, if somebody truly is allergic or if you don't want to take a chance, dilute Benadryl injectable works very nicely for a short period of time. It doesn't last as long. It only lasts about 15 or 20 minutes. But it does give equianalgesia just by injecting a little bit of Benadryl around the wound. 
So keep that in mind. That's, that's not adding it to the lidocaine. I'm talking about using Benadryl as a local anesthetic. And it worked pretty well. So how do we make the injection painless? Lots of studies on this. There, this was a big thing back when I was in residency. Uh, people were doing all of these studies putting bicarb into lidocaine, trying to make it painless. Uh, lidocaine is relatively acid. So by neutralizing it, we could make the pain less. And you've got to do something with the bicarb now, right? Because you just heard today that it's no longer part of the ACLS protocol. Does, does that make you wonder what we've been doing for the last 50 years? With the ACLS protocol, lidocaine. Oh, no, you don't, we don't use lidocaine anymore. Okay, bicarb, no. Atropine for PEA, no. No. I mean, I, granted, none of the studies ever showed that they weren't, but they were just so much a part of what we did. Um, different topic. Okay, um, it did reduce the pain of injection significantly by buffering with lidocaine. So this was immediately jumped on, and I think the research is clear enough already. You do not have to do any more studies on this. A little bit of lidocaine, I'm sorry, a little bit of bicarb in the lidocaine will buffer it and make it a less painful injection. Now this is sort of one of those, well, duh, studies, but somebody actually did it. Edlick looked at the size of needle, and guess what? The smaller the needle, the less it hurts. How about that? Slow injection works better than fast injection. The third author on this, Rich Scarafone, is a pediatric ER doc, so it's been studied in kids and in adults. And it just, just take the extra few seconds, 10 seconds or so to inject, rather than just blasting it in there. It, it, it has to do with stretching of the um, pexinian corpuscles. And if you just slowly let them expand, it's a lot less painful than getting the medicine in quickly. Injecting into deep tissues hurts less than injecting into superficial tissues, but you've got to wait. It takes up to six minutes to get good anesthesia if you inject into the deep tissues. If you inject subdermally, you're going to get instant anesthesia after the initial pain, and you can tell because you've got that wheel, that little raise in the skin right there. And that's great, but that hurts like crazy. So just inject more deeper and wait a couple of minutes. Injecting into the wound edges hurts worse than injecting the skin around the wound. It does not increase the infection rate. There was this rumor going around, I remember this, when surgeons were saying you can't inject into the wound because you're going to inoculate the wound with the surface bacteria. So to numb a wound, you actually have to go around the outside of the wound and stick the skin. Well, that's not true, and that's horribly painful to stick the skin that many times. There are studies now which show you inject into the wound edges and you don't inoculate any superficial bacteria deep into the wound. Digital block hurts less than direct injection into a digit. Um, my trick with the digital block, now there's, there's actually three different ways you can do a digital block. And for years and years I did it from the dorsal side. But then I learned it's actually less painful and works better if you go in from the palmar side directly to the bifurcation. Now, it still hurts, but what you do is what's called a digital distraction technique. As you're injecting into a distal part with your dominant hand, your non-dominant hand is up above the laceration, doing something like this, doing distracting techniques. Try that. Try that. You'll be amazed how it makes a difference. It interrupts the pain cycle. It interrupts that flow of pain from distal by just doing something proximal to it. And it doesn't have to be anything organized. <clears throat> How long the anesthetics last? I think everybody knows this now. Lidocaine, 30 to 60 minutes. Bupivacaine lasts up to uh, four hours. There is no advantage to mixing the two in a syringe. If you want long pain relief, just go straight to the bupivacaine. I still have a partner who likes to mix them because he says, well, the lidocaine works faster and then the bupivacaine lasts longer. And the lidocaine might work 20 or 30 seconds faster, but I don't think that really adds much to the clinical picture. So just stick with the bifibicane. Now, TAC was out there for a while. TAC is the tetracaine adrenaline cocaine topical. And it was never approved by the FDA. It had to be mixed by a pharmacist. And medicinal cocaine is expensive. So this stuff was about 35 bucks a dose. 
But it worked. It worked. I don't know if anybody's still using TAC. Um, it worked incredibly well, especially in kids. But the cocaine was a problem. There were two case reports back in the late 80s. Five-year-old girl in whom it was used inappropriately. They actually put it on the buccal mucosa. You're not supposed to do that. She absorbed the cocaine and she went into status epilepticus. And then there was a seven and a half month old male who had a lip laceration who was licking his lips and went home and was found dead in his crib a couple of hours later. So the cocaine can be a problem. Instead, what we have is let or zap. The first case reports on this, it was called zap, and I still prefer zap. Zap is xylocaine, adrenaline, potocaine. Lead, of course, is lidocaine, epinephrine, tetracaine. They're the same thing. They just have the different acronyms. Um, again, it is not FDA approved. It has to be mixed by your pharmacist, but it works terrifically. It works just as well as TAC. I have to be careful how I phrase this. Um, I also talk about dealing with nosebleeds, and I use let for nosebleeds anymore instead of cocaine. And at one meeting, I said, I haven't used cocaine for 15 years, and two people in the front row started to applaud. Uh, <laughs> I, think, I think it was in California, though. So. <laughs> so you can avoid having the medical cocaine by using this combination, the lidocaine, epinephrine, tetracaine. Um, does vasoconstricting affect healing? This is still a matter of controversy. We have two different studies that show different results. One study says exposure wounds to attack damaged host defenses and increased susceptibility toward infection. You'll notice it doesn't say that it increased the infection rate. It increased the susceptibility toward infection, so they were using some sort of surrogate marker there. And this other study said, no, it doesn't. It does not increase the bacterial proliferation more than lidocaine infiltration in contaminated experimental wounds. Oh, well, nuts. That's not my patient either. I don't have patients with contaminated experimental wounds. I have patients with real wounds. Okay, so the jury is still out on this. Uh, how sterile is necessary? Gautam Badwala did this study 30 years ago. Um, Interesting, because Gautam was actually president of the International Federation a few years ago. Uh, this is, despite his name, he's actually practicing in England. Uh, he has an ER named after him there. Uh, but he did this study with gloves versus no gloves. No change. No difference in the final infection rate. Now, we don't wear gloves to protect the patient these days, do we? We wear gloves to protect ourselves. But there are now two studies that show non-sterile gloves work just as well as sterile gloves. And you can save the money on the sterile gloves for lacerations. And this is a hard one to make people, people who've been doing this for a long time, a lot of people have a hard time giving up their sterile gloves. But the data is pretty clear. We don't need the sterile gloves. It's a small savings, but it's some savings. Sterile gloves are kind of expensive. Um, there have been at least three studies that showed that wearing a face mask doesn't make any difference in the infection rate. Shaving, I think the surgeons have shown us that shaving increases infection rate, so we don't shave anymore. If hair is in the way, you can clip it and get it out of the way. But anytime you shave, you damage the skin, and that does increase the infection rate. How about disinfecting the skin? There is no ideal agent for disinfecting the skin. Everything is either tissue toxic or doesn't kill bacteria. So a simple scrub with soap and water around the wound should be sufficient. If the wound is contaminated, we've known for 30 years that debridement is the primary step, the most important step. It gets rid of that contaminated tissue the tissue that's contaminated with bacteria, and it gets rid of the devitalized tissue. The, the human body is an amazing healer. I'm sure everyone in the room knows this. You have seen wounds that looked absolutely horrible when they presented, and six months later you had to look twice to see that there was actually a scar there. So be generous with debridement. Be generous with debridement. The body is very forgiving. The skin is very forgiving. This is something that I think a lot of people have forgotten. And this is what we used to do in Vietnam. 
we would see guys with shrapnel wounds. We would pull the shrapnel out. We would bring them back at 48 hours. We would bring them back at 96 hours. We would do a dressing change the first time. If at 96 hours there was still no sign of infection, we would then close the wound. You know what our infection rate was? 5%, exactly the same as a primary closure in any other wound. So delayed primary closure, you watch the wound. If, you, if you're worried about contamination, you watch the wound for 96 hours. One revisit, you might not even want to do that if you've got a reliable patient. You can just bring them back in four days and do a closure. And the end result is exactly the same as if you'd done a primary closure. <clears throat> the final scar is the same as if you'd done a primary closure. How do you clean the wound? Never put anything in a wound that you wouldn't put in your own eye. If you wouldn't put peroxide in your eye, don't put it in a wound. If you wouldn't put uh, povidone iodine in your eye, don't put it in a wound. Just keep that in mind. That'll help a lot. Um, now, 1% povidone iodine does not decrease tissue strength, but it doesn't decrease the rate of wound infections either. Lino Weaver actually did a really nice study at this. He looked at different concentrations of povidone iodine, sodium hypochlorite, hydrogen peroxide, acetic acid. These are all experimental wounds, of course. These are all little rats. Um, you know, they did a lot of rat face wound um, experiments back then. And what he found was the only antiseptic that was not harmful to fibroblasts and yet still was bacteriostatic was povidone iodine 0.001%. What's the solution of povidone iodine you have in your office or emergency department? 10%. So that should last your entire career. <laughs> because to get a solution of 0.001%, you need to mix one milliliter of that in 10 liters of water. Yeah. COVID-19 surgical scrub, I hope, has gone to the tar pits. It is a dangerous thing to have around wounds. It might still be useful in cleaning intact skin, but around wounds it greatly increases the infection rate. Uh, soaking, that's one of my pet peeves. I come in and I see somebody with their foot soaking in a basin of brown liquid, like you're dying an Easter egg or something. Um, not only does soaking not decrease the bacterial count in wounds, uh, if you soak it in normal saline, the bacterial count actually goes up. So don't soak wounds. It doesn't do any good, and it may do some harm. So how do we clean the wounds if we're not going to soak them? Well, you need to irrigate them. You need to irrigate them. Here's some rat face wounds again. Bulb syringe versus jet lavage in experimentally contaminated wounds, and it showed that all bacteriologic loads were less when you lavage the wounds. 35 milliliter syringe, 19 gauge needle, gives you about seven pounds per square inch. And again, there was this rumor out there, well, if it's a contaminated wound, and if you put too much pressure on it with the fluid, you're actually gonna force bacteria into the wound and increase the infection rate. It's been studied, no. The water may go into the tissues, but the bacteria doesn't. So there's no increase of infection by using the high pressure irrigation. Adam Singer did this study where he looked at both 35 milliliter and 65 milliliter syringes and a 19 gauge needle, and that was effective for high pressure lavage. The reason I show you the quote is the use of IV bags and plastic bottles should be discouraged. You've seen this, you may have done this. Standing there with the plastic IV bottle and the water coming out, trickling out the end like you're watering the wound, um, that does not decrease the bacterial count. And then you've seen some people take 18 gauge needle, poke a hole in the top of the irrigant, and you can't get seven pounds per square inch with that. So it's really better to go with the syringe of course, there is splash. Uh, that can be prevented by using a splash shield or a splash guard, which are dirt cheap. 
And the guy who invented that is not a millionaire. I wish he were because it's a terrific. It's one of those simple, brilliant devices, the splice guard, the thing that looks like a giant Morgan lens that you stick on the end of a syringe. Um, he, still, he still attends medical meetings. He still works clinically. Uh, I see him every year at our annual scientific assembly. And I say, you're not retired yet? He says, no. <laughs> um, wounds less than six hours old. Look at this. Irrigated with tap water, 5%. Irrigated with normal saline, 20% infection rate. What the heck is that? Initially, that doesn't pass the sniff test. And you don't find the next two studies in the medical literature. You find them in the nursing literature. A couple of nurses, as their projects, went around and cultured all the open bottles of saline that they found in the emergency department. And lo and behold... A lot of them were contaminated. About 20% of opened bottles of saline were contaminated. They grew something out in culture. Now, I know we're all on cost-cutting missions, but the way to cut costs is not with a dollar bottle of saline by trying to reuse it and stretch its use. Once the bottle is open, use what you need and then get rid of it. But there are now a couple of studies that show tap water irrigation is just as good as saline. So saline as an irrigant for a wound should probably go away also. If, if your city water department is doing its job, that's a sterile solution coming out of the tap, right? So that's what you need is a sterile solution under pressure. Judd Hollander did this study. Uh, I love this. Clean face wounds. He didn't irrigate half of them. Half of them he just left alone. And every single one of them did absolutely fine. Remember, face wounds, manure, teaspoon, put it, you know. I mean, these do fine no matter what you do to them. Splatter, lots of studies on the, uh, the different systems to cut that on splatter. Do we follow the protocols? Eh, it's an old study now. 20 years ago, no, we were not following up. 38% soaked the wounds and never bothered to irrigate them. I don't have any more current information than this. I have to assume that we've improved, though. And 67% actually scrubbed the entire wound surface before they sutured. So what suture material, um, how are we doing on time? Let me go through this. There are some newer sutures out there, the, the absorbable, the non-absorbable. You may have heard that running stitches are no good. Uh, the baseball stitch is absolutely fine at a low pressure area. I tend to use it on the face, especially with the elbow to the eyebrow playing basketball or wrestling. And as long as the person doesn't go out and get re-elbowed in the same place, it's fine. The downside of the running stitch, of course, is once it's cut in one place, the whole thing falls apart. Um, but as long as it's a relatively protected area, I think it's a nice way to close. Certainly the enclosure is fine. Now, I thought this was really interesting. Look at the date on this study, 1956. That is 55 years ago when bacterial contamination of simple wounds is moderate, Suture foreign bodies are the sine qua known for development of wound infection. In other words, the dead space. If you put sutures in the dead space, you will cause infection in contaminated wounds. And I think this idea of closing the dead space is slowly going away. But every 10 years, somebody wants to redo it and show the same thing. Leaving the dead space resulted in lower infection rates than obliterating it with sutures. We are perfectionists. We like things to be neat. We don't like to see that little open area down there. But here we've got studies that show if we try to close that, it actually increases the infection rate. What can you use other than sutures? Um, this is 87 ER patients. 65% were closed in 30 seconds using staples. So the staplers are really nice. They're not that expensive. The staplers are maybe 20 bucks. And even if you're only doing one or two staples, it's worth it. Now, I'll tell you, now, usually I say conserve, but who has had to staple a kid's scalp? Yeah, have you ever been able to get more than one staple in? Okay, what you can do is if you have a, if you have a wound that's a little bit longer, Michelle Lynn taught me this trick. She said it's a little expensive, but it's worth it. You have two people with staplers, you do a countdown, and then you both staple at the same time. I like that idea. I like that idea. So um, staples work really well. And something else you might consider 
is the, um, the hair apposition technique. Staple, this just shows that staples take less time. Uh, patients preferred staples. We all have used Steri strips. Uh, they're not that good. Uh, they stay on, well, I'm sorry, let me, let me back up. The Steri strips are usually okay for small non-tension lacerations. But what's not that good is the benzoin. Everybody wants to paint the skin with benzoin and that'll make it stickier and stay on longer. Comparative studies, benzoin, no benzoin, no difference. The strips of tape fall off exactly the same, whether you use benzoin or not. Uh, pretibial lacerations heal better. The, old, the, the little old lady in the nursing home with the skin that's peeled back off the tibia, the steri strips work a lot better than... For one thing, if you try to suture these things, what happens? The tissue just shreds. So the steri strips work real well for that. Uh, we now have several of the uh, cyanoacrylate skin, um, skin glues out there. But wilderness people, well, you're living in the middle of wilderness people here. You, they've known about super glue for years. Every, every rock climber where there's salt carries super glue in his backpack. So when he had a, or he or she now, excuse me, um, I heard yesterday, um, I heard of a female professional rock climber. I had no idea such people existed, that there were professional rock climbers. But that's how she makes a living, is rock climbing. Um, but they've been closing wounds with super glue for years and getting away with it. This is just fancy medical super glue. It's exactly the same. It's a different between a butyl cyanoacrylate and an octal cyanoacrylate. One is medical, one is not. But they're essentially exactly the same thing. Now, here's the hair apposition technique that I was talking about. If you haven't done this, this is really cool. Is if you have somebody with a scalp laceration and their hair is long enough, you just take hairs on either side of the wound tie a square knot and bring the edges of the wound together. Now, hair tends to be slippery, so it's hard to hold the knot. What we used to use was colloidian, and I haven't seen a bottle of colloidian in the emergency department in 20 years, but now we've got the tissue glues. We've got the dermabond and the other things. So you take a couple of drops of that, you put it on the knot after you pull the hair together, and then over the next couple of weeks, as the knot grows out, the parent or somebody can just cut the knot out. It works like a charm. It works like a charm. Topical antibiotic creams uh, don't make any difference in healing. Maybe a little bit, but not much. Uh, there is conflicting data on infection. And until recently, I hadn't really seen any study that showed there was improvement with topical antibiotics. Because let's face it, within 24 hours, the fibroblasts have bridged across the wound, and nothing's going to get into the wound anyway after 24 hours. But there's been a recent study that showed that topical antibiotics may help. I'm not saying don't use them. They're inexpensive, they're safe, and certainly they, if you let the patient have something to do, um, I, I personally think sometimes that just the simple act of rubbing something on a wound is healing in itself. It increases circulation. It brings stuff to the wound site itself. Uh, but I would caution you why people are still using the silver sulfadiazine is beyond me because silvadine more than doubled the infection rate in the studies that were looked at. But here again is that 5%, placebo 5%. Neosporin, 5%. Bacitracin, 5%. That's just the background noise. That's what we're stuck with is a 5% infection rate. How long should the dressing stay on? A disgusting study where they left the dressing on until the sutures were removed. And what was their infection rate? 5%. When the dressing was taken off at 24 hours, what was the infection rate? 5%. Let people take the dressing off. Let people clean it with soap and water. Um, can I get the stitches wet? Yeah, you can get the stitches wet. Just don't scrub too hard on them. But certainly it's okay to go home and take a shower and get all that disgusting blood out of your hair. I would encourage you to do that after I've sewn up your bloody scalp laceration. And it doesn't increase the infection rate. Okay, who gets antibiotics? Look at this study, 50th anniversary of this study. Systemic antibiotics have no effect 
on primary staphylococcal infections and the bacteria creating the infection have been in the tissue longer than three hours. So there is no advantage to giving so-called prophylactic antibiotics. Now, Ed Lake in 86 said he recommends antibiotics if the chance of infection is more than 10%. Delay in cleansing of greater than six hours? Uh, no, we've shown that's not true. The Burke study in 1988 showed that wasn't true. Stellate cut with abraded skin edges. Well, you're supposed to debride those. It's far better to debride the wound than it is to throw antibiotics at it. Soiled by saliva, feces, or vaginal secretions. Uh, maybe, maybe, but I still think irrigation is the way to go. Dirty or contaminated wounds or feet. All right, feet we'll come back to. But this is an argument for people, 25-year-old argument for who should get prophylactic antibiotics. He says use a broad-spectrum antibiotic, first dose IV, but here's the pearl out of this. And this is the big pearl I want you to take. I want you to ignore the rest of it because we're going to address those if we haven't already. Treatment for more than three days is unwarranted. If you choose to give prophylactic antibiotics after a wound, it should be for no more than three days. Remember, the number needed to harm with antibiotics is about 10. About one out of 10 people, you write a prescription for antibiotic who takes the antibiotic, will get a rash, uh, they'll get a vaginal infection, they'll get diarrhea, and then at the other end of the spectrum, they might get anaphylaxis or a Stevens-Johnson syndrome. That doesn't happen that often. But nonetheless, the number needed to treat to harm with antibiotic is 10. Who sh uh, how about artificial heart valves? There's still no recommendation on this. Again, this is simple lacerations. There are case reports of patients getting heart um, uh, endocarditis after simple wounds. Artificial joints. It's an older study, 27 cases of hematogenous infection. At least five were due to infection from the skin. Does this mean we should be giving antibiotics to these people with simple lacerations? I don't think so. I think the answer is still in careful cleaning of the wound. I don't think it is in throwing antibiotics. Now, our hand physicians have chosen to become rather evidence resistant on this, and they still insist on prophylactic antibiotics on many hand lacerations, even though here are four studies which show no advantage in giving an oral antibiotic with a simple hand wound. Other body sites, exactly the same. Oral antibiotic, no effect on the clinical course of most simple wounds. Human bites have a bad reputation. The problem with a lot of these is selection bias. Does every hungover male wake up on Sunday morning, look at his hand, Say, gee, it looks like I was in a fight last night. Maybe I better go to the emergency department. No, we see the ones who have infection. We have no idea what the denominator is. We see the people who are infected. So these have gotten a bad reputation because of that. But it may not be true. I don't know. It may be true. Maybe we do see every one of them. But this, Doug Lindsay did this study in Arizona. Um, instant, he was the, the house doctor for this large institution, a group of institutionalized, mentally challenged people. And they bit each other a lot. And um, his numbers said that there were a lot of infection. And I, if you look at the study, I think what he was describing more was inflammation rather than infection. He said the bites had about an 18% infection rate and simple cuts had 13% infection rate. And that's what doesn't pass the sniff test with me. If the simple cuts had a 13% infection rate, because every other study has shown that 5% rate consistent. So I'm not sure that it's the same thing that we would call infection. Um, 33 children bitten by other children. Four were infected on presentation. 16 got antibiotic, one got infected. 30 got no antibiotics and nobody got infected. 
doesn't seem to make much of a difference, small study. 322 bites in children, Doug Baker's study, um, most were superficial abrasions. Puncture wounds are the problem. Puncture wounds are the problem, 38% infection rate. And then 11% were frank lacerations and 37% got infected. Is this enough to give a prophylactic antibiotic? Probably, probably. I'm still not sure the numbers we have are real because I think a lot of this is presentation bias. But apparently in the people who presented, there was some advantage to giving antibiotics. Um, lots of things get bitten. Um, eyelids, ears, lips all chewed off and sewn back on and people did absolutely fine. Uh, the main reason I'm showing you this study is the name of the author. Um, his name really was You Bite. Uh, but, but he talked a little bit about um, prophylaxis, tetanus prophylaxis, cephalosporin, reexamination within 24 hours. Um, how about dog bites? How about dog bites? I think that there's a little bit of a referral bias with dog bites and that we see people, we tend to see people who have an established infection more or we see them for the laceration. I think if you look really closely at the literature, it's probably about the same 5% infection rate that we see with all other lacerations. Uh, Cummings did a meta-analysis and showed that the number needed to treat to prevent one infection was 14, which is a little higher than the 20 that we have with the background, the, the background noise. Um, Mike Callahan, who's now editor of Annals of Emergency Medicine, found that there was one study that didn't pass the sniff test on the meta-analysis and he dropped it, and now the number needed to treat is 26, which means there's a 4% infection rate on dog bites. There's that 5% again right in there. And at that time, he said very generously, if you treat 100 dog bite victims at $20 per prescription, you will prevent 3.8 infections at a cost of $526 each. That was when antibiotics were $20 a prescription. What is now the recommended antibiotic or bites. It's amoxicillin clavulinate, which is more like $120 for a prescription. Cat bites. I love this. This is one study, one study that led to Sanford Guide saying 80% of cat bites get infected. Five out of six got infected. And Sanford, for the last 25 years, has said the same thing. 80% of cat bites get infected. All right, little survey here. Who owns a cat? Does the cat bite you? How many times have your cat bite gotten infected? You got two there. Anybody? And one over there. Okay. Does that look like about 5% to you? <laughs> Just curious. Just curious, because again, this is all referral bias. People come to see us with a dog bite because they got this big gash and they're worried about a scar. Why do people come see us with a cat bite? Because it's infected. It's infected. We don't know what the background noise is. I do this little survey every time I give a talk on either this or on, uh, on bias in the literature or what have you, and I always get the same response. I get about 30, 40% of the audience has a cat. At least half of those people have been bitten by the cat. And rarely does anybody say they ever got infected from the cat bite. One of these days I'll make it a formal study. Um, and here Callahan says five days. Maximum treatment for prophylaxis, five days. I stick with the three day. If you want to extend it to five days, Okay, but I don't think there's any benefit. I don't think there's ever been shown benefit above three days. Now, you talk about a wound with a bad reputation that has no science behind it. Who has stepped on a nail? Okay, who's gotten an infection from stepping on a nail? One, two, okay. Okay. Two people have said they've had infection from stepping on a nail. And yet, what is your interpretation of the literature about foot puncture wounds? That they're high risk, that they need prophylactic antibiotics, that they need careful watching. 
And yet I just saw at least 60 people in this room hold their hands up and two people said they had infections. It's referral bias. People come see us either because they want a tetanus shot. There's this weird perception that tetanus grows on barbed wire and nails. Have you noticed that? People think tetanus, no, no, tetanus comes from stool. It comes from the ground. But for some reason, people have gotten this idea that tetanus comes from nails and from barbed wire. Um, Terry Chisholm came out with a relatively reasonable suggestion here, but if you follow... If you follow the literature on this, there's really no good data about who is actually at high risk for infection from a puncture wound. Intraoral cuts, you just leave them open. Suturing them actually increases the infection rate. Now, a fair warning, if you leave an intraoral cut open, you have to warn the patient what it's going to look like. Because you know how you get that fibrous cap over it when the saliva actually starts digesting? What does the patient see that as? Oh my God, that's pus. There's something white on the wound, so it must be pus. You gotta warn somebody, you know, you're gonna try to digest this like you would any other meat, and it's gonna get this white cover on it. So as long as you recognize that, you're gonna be okay. And there are other things you can look for for infection. Um, 62 patients with full thickness through and through, prospective double blind placebo controlled, and there was a trend towards the penicillin treated group having fewer infections. It never reached statistical significance. Okay, I'm going to stop there. A um, lot of material. Did you guys get handouts for this? Because I've got the full bibliography. No? Okay. Um, how can we send the bibliography out? Because I've got all of this stuff on... Um, it's available on eMed Home, but if you're not a subscriber to eMed Home, you can't get access to it. And I really don't want to send it individually to 200 people. Um, so some, some way we'll figure it out. The CD, okay, good. Because it's, it's in the folder that I left back here. I dropped a folder of material off on that computer, and the bibliography is there. Okay, good. Oh, yeah, the website would be great. That would be great. And if anybody wants these slides, I, I'm very generous with my slides. If anybody wants to use these slides as a basis for a talk back at your own home place, just get in touch with me. I'm more than happy to share them with you. Yes? Benadryl is a local anesthetic, yeah. Okay, in full concentration or in the 10 to 1 dilution? Well, so my suggestion would be I wonder if that's the Benadryl or the excipient, the polyethylene glycol. Yeah. But this study was done with a 10 to 1 dilution, and it showed relatively good anesthesia, comparable. But, but you may be right. It may be just that pressure. Okay. 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 Uh -huh. Wonderful. Okay. So some, yeah, some, a little bit of advice from the field. Um, oh, wow. Okay. Yes. On feet, yeah, I, I did. That was, that was what I said about stepping on the, uh, stepping on a nail. 
lacerations, they're, they're really not at any higher risk for infection. They're really not as long as you prep the wound the right way. Yes? I'm injecting before to try to make the irrigation a little simpler or a little less painful on the patient because I'm a vigorous irrigator or whoever I'm supervising, I make sure they vigorously irrigate. Um, in, in irrigation, for that matter, in upper extremity stuff, you can send somebody to the sink and that works absolutely fine because you can get a nice little pressure head build up out of the faucet. Scrubbing, scrubbing can be disruptive if you do gentle scrubbing, um, not using any of the tissue toxic things like uh, hydrogen peroxide or povidone iodine. That can help. Yes. Well, those are the ones that have the bad reputation. And the fact is, in, in what I do, and all I can tell you is what I do, is I say, look, this has been reported to cause problems with pseudomonas. So that's what everybody's worried about, is pseudomonas osteomyelitis after a puncture through a tennis wound. By my reading of the literature, the chances of this getting infected are about 1 in 20. If you get these signs of infection, you come back and we will get you started on the right antibiotic right away. By my reading of the literature, there is no advantage in giving you an antibiotic now. And I think there is a downside. When the chances of infection are 1 in 20 and the chances of doing harm are 1 in 10, I think that has to be factored in. Yes? Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Tap water. Yeah. Um, no, I, if, again, if you wouldn't put it in your eye, don't put it in the wound. So I don't recommend scrubbing the wound with any particular chemical. But just plain water to irrigate, I think, works fine. I've not heard about that. What what type of water system? Was was that was that in? Okay, that's what I yeah. That was my next question. Which peer reviewed journal was that published in? National Enquirer doesn't count. <laughs> okay, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah, and then just this morning there was a Medscape blurb about how the bed bugs are now carrying MRSA. Oh, no. <laughs> yes? Uh, how does all the infection rate and prophylaxis change over the diabetics? You're obviously going to want to be more liberal with antibiotics in somebody who is, is brittle diabetic. Um, I can't give you the exact numbers, but I do know in my diabetic females, if I start them on antibiotic, I just write a prescription for a Diflucan tablet and say, you may or may not need this, but you'll have it. It'll save you a trip back to the doc. Because that's the big thing I worry about with diabetic women, is I know I'm going to give them a yeast infection if I start them on antibiotic. But I don't have exact numbers for you. Yes, sir. Procedural sedation. Ketamine is a wonderful drug. Those I do scrub. I don't use chemicals, but I scrub, scrub the daylights out of them. And to do that, you have to knock somebody out. And you have to put them in a dissociative state with ketamine, essentially. And we're getting very comfortable with ketamine in the emergency department. Um, I'm embarrassed to say that despite working at a uh, tertiary center, we don't have propofol in our emergency department yet. 
and yet a lot of surrounding community ER doc, or ERs do have the propofol. But um, I think we're past the point where fentanyl and uh, midazolam should be used for painful procedures like that. I really think we do need to do something that, that gives a dissociative state such as uh, propofol or ketamine and then scrub the heck out of stuff. Yes? Uh huh. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Oh, no, no, no. The booster, well, okay. What the booster does is stimulate the body's own natural defense mechanism. So the problem with this is a passive immunity. And the TIG, the tetanus immune globulin, is an active immunity. It's, it's, it's just like rabies. You know, rabies, when somebody comes in with exposure to rabies, we give them the active immunity with the RIG, the rabies immune globulin, which is weight-based, and then we get them started on the, um, uh, the HDCV or something else to give them the passive immunity with a series of shots. Um, is the emergency department the only place that carries the immune globulin? Well, that's not right. You can, oh yeah, still give them the tetanus. It's just going to be a passive immunity that takes several weeks to develop. Yeah. Okay. All right, they want me to stop. They, they want me to stop and go on. Okay. Um, all right. And I'll... I'm going to cut this one a little bit short. Um, and if you have other questions about wound care, I'll try to answer them afterwards. I'll stick around for a couple of hours afterwards. <laughs>